So first reaction is, I get it, keep talking. The second reaction is, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, but I'm willing to listen. Um, and the third reaction is, you must be joking. How can games ever make a difference in, in a place like school? How can they be serious enough to make a difference? Um, and, I, and I wrote this book sort of trying to answer just a couple of key kind of strange questions that sort of started popping up after I started talking to people in this space, not just teachers, but game designers and experts like Kurt and his wife. Um, so I started asking questions like, could play, ironically, make school a more rigorous yet enjoyable place? Could play make school harder? Um, and it was, you know, it was at a time when we were really seeing technology just sort of take off in all these different ways. Um, if you are of my generation, you remember this sign from when you were a kid, right? Um, my kids see this sign differently than I do, right? So my kid, I used to see, you know, if you see someone drowning, help them, right? And my kids see, if you see someone drowning, laugh out loud with bacon, right? <laughs> okay. So. I'm going to take you to very quickly through kind of a geeky, geeky couple of slides about something called Moore's Law. If you're familiar with it, just close your eyes and take a nap. If you're not, here's, here's what Moore's Law is. So it, it, it talks about basically how quickly um, computers get better. Okay, um, It's named after Gordon Moore um, from Intel. Basically what it says is that computers in a very sort of predictable way are going to get smarter, they're going to get faster, they're going to get cheaper, they're going to get more efficient. Um, and they're going to get smaller. And so I, I was trying to figure out like what the real meaning of this is while I was researching the book. And I came upon a, a computer scientist from the University of Washington um, who, who basically said, OK, take something you can understand, like a 71 Camaro. OK, so in 1971, this, this car could do basically the things it can do now, right? It could go about 60, 70, maybe 80, 90 miles an hour. It got about, what, 12, 15 miles to the gallon, et cetera, and so forth. OK. He said, OK, take the, the advancement we've seen in microchips from 1971 to about hmm, the beginning of this decade. OK. And he said, just, let's just take that uh, arc of improvement. And this is what this car could do today if it improved like your, our computer chips did. So he said it, could, it would now go 6 million miles an hour. It would get you to the moon and back in five minutes. <clears throat> you can get from New York to San Francisco on half a cup of gas. It'd be quite efficient. It would cost $9, <laughs> and it would be as big as the head of a match. Okay? That's a match there. Um, so this is Moore's Law, right? You know, basically geometric improvement, okay, over, the, over this 40-year you know, period. So if we take what happened in schools during this 40-year period, you know, we see something really kind of different. This is what we see has happened in schools over that almost exact same period, basically not much. And I was trying to figure out like if technology can improve and change the way we live in so many different ways, why isn't it penetrating in schools? Um, there are lots of lots of different reasons for that. But so one of them is this. So we have this idea about technology, you know, we, we you know, at the time I started researching the book, we were having this sort of weird national freak out about kids and, and uh, devices, right? Um, we had this idea that, you know, every kid with a phone was basically sort of a professional at ignoring the people around them, right? They'd gotten so good at this, um, you know, but we'd sort of forgotten that we've been doing this with, with devices for decades, right? We're like, we're good at ignoring each other no matter what the device is. Um, this is a great quote, you know, I heard from a lot of parents as I was researching this book, like in the 90s, you know, like remember the 90s, our families were all like much tighter before all this bullshit happened. You know, what you, you don't realize is that, you know, this quote came from, well, is it going to be cut off? I think it's cut off. Um, this is from 1929. Okay. And this is somebody talking about the 1890s and they were complaining about the automobile pulling families and communities apart. Um, you know, we were seeing this sort of moral panic about things like screen addiction, right? You know, digital heroin. Um, and I wanted to really sort of get beneath this, you know. 
Um, video games were, were sort of the worst of the worst to a lot of people, right? To a lot of parents. You know, there's, sort of, there's this idea that they made our kids sort of crazy. Um, they sort of checked out when they were playing them. And they, worst of all, they made our kids violent. Or so we thought, right? Um, so here's a quiz. So I'm going to shine four um, titles, uh, video game titles. These are from the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, the Sandy Hook Shooter, Adam Lanza, played one of these four games pretty much every day for a decade before he shot the school up um, two years ago. So take 20 seconds, talk amongst yourselves, figure out which game it is. OK, so you're all smart enough to realize that it was a trick. And the game was Dance Dance Revolution. If you look up the Connecticut State Police report on the Sandy Hook shooting, you realize that everyone, all his friends and everybody he knew told the police he was totally gone on Dance Dance Revolution. Um, so we start to have to sort of rethink our ideas about what games do to our kids. Um, anyway, that aside, um, you know, we had this sort of idea that even though science was telling us one thing, we were thinking another thing about video games. And I was really fascinated with this. I really wanted to get beneath this. Um, the first inkling of something really happening in terms of education was when I started reading um, about something called hard fun. Um, and hard fun is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Um, we do something, we, we enjoy something, oftentimes, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. We like a challenge. And this is actually going to be the name of the title of my book until I tried to go buy the URL and realized that it was already owned by... <laughs> they wanted $7,000 for it. Um, it's, the, it's, it's the title of the first chapter. So, um, so I started reading um, some theoretical stuff by uh, folks like this, Jesper Yule. So he's this Danish, really interesting game designer. Um, and one of the things he says, he said he wrote this book um, about failure. And he says that failure is key to games, OK? And in a very specific way, um, he says, I dislike failing in games, but I dislike not failing even more. So think about that for a second, OK? You pick up a game. You pick up any game at all, which is some lousy you know, um, Candy Crush game or a console game that takes weeks and weeks to play. Failing is not fun, but not failing is even worse, right? Um, so he's got this idea that for something to be a game, forget just a good game, how about just a game, we, respect, we, we expect something to push back at us. Um, and his thought experiment about this was kind of interesting when he says, okay, imagine a game where you couldn't fail. This is it. This is the game, right? You push the button, the game is done, no chance of failing. Um, but he goes even a step further, and this is where I think where I want to start thinking about how this relates to school. He says something that I thought was really, really important. He says this. He says, if we compare sort of games to everything else we do in our lives and sort of the things we do in our day, they're, they're kind of set apart. He says, we're not necessarily disappointed if we find it easy to learn to drive a car, but we're disappointed if a game is too easy. OK, so now let's think about the kinds of things kids confront when they're playing games, right? These are the sorts of things that happen in games, right? This is not too easy. This is not hiding our kids from failure. This is basically you know, asking them to do something that they might very well fail at, trying to build something just this incredible, OK? And you can see, you know, just go online and just type in you know, Minecraft uh, building projects. Um, kids are doing amazing things. Um, this is just a, your typical sort of everyday screenshot from World of Warcraft, okay? That's a lot of data going through, going by, right? Um, there's a lot to keep track of. There's a lot to think about. Um, yet when they go to school, there's this, if anything, there's this uh, sense that we need to protect them from failing, okay? So if you look at some of the really interesting research coming out of places like Indiana University, you know, it says that 65% of students are bored at least every day in class, and 16% are bored in every class. Um, and if you read Amanda Ripley's book from a couple of years ago, really fascinating book, The Smartest Kids in the World, one of the things she said was that she, she polled um, exchange students who came here from other countries, and nine of 10 of them said school was easier where they came from. And she polled Americans who went abroad, and 70% of them said the same thing. School is easier here. 
Um, and this is, of course, you know, kind of her key quote. At school in America was many things, but it was not, generally speaking, all that challenging. The evidence suggests we've been systematically underestimating what our kids can handle, especially in math and science. Okay. Um, and this is the reaction we get, naturally, right? We're sort of boring our kids to death. Um, and it's as if, you know, going back to Jesper Yule, we've sort of given them this sort of big red button and just said, just press the button, okay? We'll make it easy for you. Um, you just let it be. Um, I want to respect sort of the other side of this argument too, which I think is just as important. Um, for a lot of kids though, school is not a very easy place. Um, and there's another reason for that. And here's, and this is a guy who has explored it really intelligently, a guy by the name of Dan Willingham from UVA. One of the things he says is that people, not just kids, but everyone is curious, but this is a fragile thing. We, we really have to take care, take care with this. That working at problems at the right level of difficulty is important, okay? We as educators have to present our young people with something that they can do. It may be challenging, it may be tough, it may be something they have to do with someone else, but it's gotta be the right level for them to be able to feel successful at, okay? And when you think about, um, <coughs> you know, he, so this is the end of his quote. When you think about sort of the difference between your experience of life and your kid's experience of your student's experience, right? If the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle is too hard for you, what do you do? You just, yeah, you just put it down, right? It's like, it's, op it's an optional hard thing, right? But for most kids, the hard things are not optional. So um, one of the things that, uh, that game designers talk about, and I think really, um, you know, is a sort of a bedrock principle, not just educational games, but games in general, is this idea of flow. Um, and you could read about this till the cows come home if, if, if you're interested. So flow is this idea, and it's, just, it's actually not even um, particular to game design. Um, it says that, if you give people something to do that's sort of poisoned midway between frustration and boredom, they're gonna enjoy it, okay? Too frustrating, they're, um, if it's frustrating, it means their skill level is not up to the task. If it's boring, it means their skill level is too advanced for the task. Um, I'm going through these ideas very quickly. There are books written on every one of these, so. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Game designers also talk about something called the magic circle. Really fascinating idea. Um, and basically what it is, the magic circle, is this mental space that's created. And you saw it this morning when you played a game um, in the discovery room. You know, it's the mental space created whenever you sit down for a game or even stand up for a game. If Kurt and I started playing um, rock, paper, scissors right here, you know, people would be craning their necks to see what happened, right? There's nothing actually taking place except him and uh, he and I just sort of you know, shooting fingers at one another, right? That's the magic circle. It happens instantaneously when a game begins. Um, and it doesn't have to be a circle. It can be kind of a square with rounded edges. Um, it can be very small. Um, and it can be very, very large. Okay, the magic circle is just an idea, right? Um, and my favorite, of course, is that um, the magic circle can really be anywhere. Um, <laughs> So there's, so this is an actual thing. So in Amsterdam, a couple of years ago at the airport, if you've ever been to the Amsterdam airport, it's one of the biggest in the world. Millions of people come through every year. They realized that men, sorry men, were rushing into the men's room, going to the urinals and making an absolute mess. So somebody said, you know what? We need to do something to, to help men sort of aim better. So somebody got the idea <coughs> to just etch a house fly into the urinal. That's not a real fly, that's a picture of a fly. Um, and they found that the spillage went down 80%, okay? Um, not sure how they measured that, but you can now buy these on, online, okay? And you can get them in all kinds of things. So, you see that? If your kids are into Star Wars, or if your husband's into Star Wars, whatever. Um, all right, a couple more ideas, and then I'm gonna let Kurt, um, Ex, ex, expand on some of some of the things that these, those guys are doing. So um, one of the other uh, ideas that really fascinated me about this, sort of this world is this idea that um, the games we love most do something for us that isn't just particular to games, it's particular to sort of the things we love in life. Um, there's an idea called um, intrinsic motivation and this is a um, 
theory that some of you may be familiar with, especially if you went to business school. So there's uh, a, a pair of uh, <coughs> researchers named um, Ryan and DC. And what they found was that if you give people three things, they'll do anything. Um, and this is in their job, in, in their family life, um, at school. If you let them have a sense of competence, autonomy, and connectedness, um, they will follow you to the end of the earth. And this has been applied. You can read books and books and books about this applied to business, right? You know, if you read like Dan Pink's books, you know, this is one of his big ideas, right? That you don't have to pay people more. You just have to give them a sense that they belong to something big, right? And they can collaborate and then they can get to wherever the path is uh, on their own, okay? And this is what kids do when they play, right? They're competent, they feel good about what they're doing, they're connected to one another, um, and they figure it out themselves. Okay, um, one last idea. Uh, you know, game designers, think about this, th think about the user experience in a way that educators, I think, really need to. Um, and you know what a user experience is, because every time you sit down at your computer or turn on your TiVo, you're having a user experience. Or when you talk to Alexa, right? They've, these people have spent years and years and millions of dollars figuring out what is that experience? How is this person experiencing that appliance on the, on the counter? Um, you know, when, when our users, kids, use the product, school, and aren't successful at it, these are the kinds of things we say to one another, right? Teachers, we say this. Ah, the kid's parents are fighting. He's watching too much TV. He's not getting enough sleep. He's not eating very well. Um, you know, we look for reasons why the, the thing isn't working, right? Um, game designers don't have that luxury, right? This is their customer. Like, this is the kid who plays their games every day. They still need to design something that, the, that he or she, increasingly, can be successful at. Um, if anything, I think this, this actually, I didn't really even give this enough credence when I was writing the book. This is almost like the biggest idea of them all, I think, that we need to look at school from the point of view of the kid. Like, what is this person's experience? And if it doesn't work, how can we blame them? Um, so, you know, Jesse Schell, um, the pretty well-known game designer, you know, he talks about um, school being an actual game, you know, if you think about the, 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 the features of a good game, you know, um, there's a countdown clock. Well, in school, that's called a due date. And there are scores. Those are called grades. The boss level is the final exam. And the leaderboard is the honor roll. Okay. And, and basically what he says is, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a game just like every game a kid plays, but it's not a very good one. Um, a real lack of surprises, lack of projection, lack of pleasures, lack of community, and a very bad interest curve. So this is, if this were a game, no kid would play it. Um, you know, school and game, they're designed experiences. Well, let's think about what the design is. Um, and I'm going to leave you with Kurt's quote. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, you know, asking what I think is a really important question, you know, if, I mean, we need to sort of reframe some of the things we're, we're thinking about in terms of, you know, what we use to reach kids. Another way to, th I'll just 20 seconds, another way to think about it, something that will, is probably hitting the teachers in the room and, and educators. And one reason, one way I like to get my head around it, I think capturing all, many of the ideas that Greg mentioned, uh, which is an excellent synthesis, um, is this phenomena of Minecraft, right? So. If you've had to deal with Minecraft in your classroom or among your students, you know, it's, it's been a phenomenon. It's amazing. As a gamer, I will say I'm really thrilled that there's this group of kids playing such a creative game because they will grow up and make games for me in my old age. So I'm looking forward to whatever it is they make. But if you look at it, it's very interesting. So a couple of themes that you see. So one is obviously the engagement thing. And I think Greg did a great job of giving an overview of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and how people are motivated to do really hard and complicated things, including failing, for fun, and that was one of the things that's always got me, in, has piqued my interest in games and kept my interest in games. What is it that designers do, and can I try to do some of those things as an, as an educator? I should say that also I'm, I am Professor UC Irvine. I'm brand new. I've been here maybe two or three weeks, just moved from Wisconsin. So I'm very much, I'm one of the people walking around in shorts. My kids are, you know, this is great. We're on holiday permanently. <laughs> And, uh, but just thoroughly loving it. And so we're all this research happened in Wisconsin. We're looking for partners and to build a big lab here in Irvine. Irvine 
has the potential and or is one of the centers for this kind of research and act activity in the world. Um, so I think it's going to be really exciting next couple of years. So um, again, so why games? First of all is engagement. Um, and what I want to argue here, this is my main kind of point of, of my talk, is that games are, provide one model for engaging kids and being active, producing uh, productive participants in society. We can look at how games do this, how game like Minecraft takes someone who may not know or care about building things with computers, engages them, hooks them, gets them along a path, borrowing this designed experience phrase uh, that Greg mentioned, toward doing something meaningful. Like when a 12-year-old when a is running a server that kids are playing on and developing policies on what you're allowed to do and not do, um, what's the rules about stealing and so on. That's kind of what you want to see happen in schools, right? You want kids to come in, they may or may not be interested, but go on to becoming engaged people who are actively being in the world and using it to do stuff of consequence. So engagement really quickly. I'm going to talk about some little bit of our research on this. This is a game called Virulent. Um, grew out of our work at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. And this, it's a science game. It's free for the iPad. It's online. You can download it, check it out. It's a little difficult and it's kind of balanced. There's a, sp a couple spots that are a little too difficult, I think. But um, the idea is that you're a virion trying to infect a host cell. Um, we worked very closely with scientists on this. And you're basically replaying the battle that's been going on for millions of years um, between cells and uh, virions. So um, we've done some studies trying to look and see what happens under learning. And um, without getting into the details, this is basically reading some text and looking at a diagram versus reading and playing a game, right? And so which one comes out better? And what we found was that reading and the game, um, students did much better. Um, and what, something that was interesting as we dug more in, um, in truth, although I think the game was, was, I won't say great, good or really good, one of the big factors actually was interest. And what we found was that the kids who were sitting there just memorizing, this is will not be a shocking, <laughs> not shocking to any educator out there. They kind of didn't care. So the kids who were staring at the diagram in the book may or may, you know, the, some, some cared enough to do it. No one really cared. But the game was actually kind of interesting and exciting to the point, I mean, at least compared to staring at a diagram, to the point where they said, oh, this is cool. So you're inside a cell and you're doing battle. Is this really what happens? Uh, something we also see is that games tend to produce a lot of questions from students as they start to wonder, is that real? How does that work? Um, so one thing I think is fascinating about games is they can work not only because they're interesting, so it's not just like um, a form of extrinsic rewards to, to build on what Greg was saying, but they can actually raise interest in the domain itself. So st students can walk away saying, I think viruses and I think the science itself is interesting, which to me is a really cool kind of finding. Um, one of the design takeaways, I think, as I step back and put my teacher hat on, I should say I was a former Montessori teacher and um, taught at um, kind of alternative schools for three or four years, is that oftentimes it's really interest that we're using games for. So you don't necessarily, if thinking again to the user experience, how are you going to try to capture and motivate and engage interest as kind of your first thing you think about um, as a unit plan? And I think games are actually a really good way to do that. So some of the implications is really focusing, and this is, again, this is, teachers tend to think this and go a little bit no duh, whereas the education research community tends to find this a little more fascinating. Like, they should be interested just because I said they were. Seems to be kind of how the logic of how most schools should be. Um, but then can we use this to foster more computational kinds of thinking? So what I'm going to do is kind of pivot from that and then talk about how we actually start to take a game like that and then build curriculum around it. And the model I want to pose for you, and take this as a, a thing that you can maybe build on, see if it works for you, is starting by some form of playing. So whether it's playing a game like um, <clears throat> the one I just mentioned, it could be everything from a, a live action role play of the Oregon Trail, something a lot of teachers have done. But starting with something where you're really playing and you're building that sort of magic circle that Greg talked about, and you're saying, let's, let's get in here and play, and that is sort of why you're here. The next... Um, phases exploring. So as they're interested, realizing that they're going to go and explore new kinds of phenomena, then doing something that looks a little bit like inquiry-based learning, where you are doing some sort of engaged study, and I'll give examples of this. And then finally, building or doing some sort of public presentation. Um, again, this is a this is not by any means wholly new. It's, it's just kind of the model we've come across that ties together some work from project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, and so on. But for our team, at least, this has been a relatively stable way to think about it. We've done this across five or six games, and it seems to be useful for us. <clears throat> and so as an example of how that works, I'm going to talk a little bit about a game that's made for third and fourth grade. Well, actually, it was originally made for sixth grade, but it seems to really find a sweet spot third to fifth grade science um, and literacy. So learning to read in content areas 
Um, you can fit a little math in there, too. Um, this is a game called Citizen Science. It's free online. You can find it. Um, developed by some my team with some graduate students and a company called Filament Games that graduated from our lab. So the idea behind this game is that you're a 13-year-old kid, and your mission is to save Lake Mendota. Um, now, this is a lake that in the Madison area, it's right in the middle of Madison. It was built kind of for Wisconsin. Inland lakes are a common thing. Um, but I think it's least adaptable to this sort of scenario. But the idea is that you're trying to save this lake. So something, again, that fascinates me, when I would play a role-playing game like Zelda or any of those games, I'm always saving the world. It's like I'm always like, hey, the world depends on you. Go save the world. But you, you, know, you never really get to do something like that quite as exciting. But what we started thinking is what about... Uh, kind of a key pressing area. So here it might be something more around drought and water shortages, possibly. But the idea is that you are a, a kid who's going to try to do something about this. Uh, we chose a kid slightly older in age just because it's going to be a little bit more motivating. The gameplay itself involves walking around, talking to people, kind of doing an investigation, collecting evidence on the watershed, and then engaging in arguments. So arguing what do you think the cause of the uh, point source pollution is. So giving you a kind of screenshot from the game, you walk around talking to scientists, you find spaces to take readings, you go out on a boat. Um, you, we have some embedded kind of digital tools in there. And then um, you can see the similar readings, just to give you a sense for kind of what the gameplay is like. You then have an inventory like another game where you carry around stuff maybe to bludgeon enemies. But instead of that, you've got evidence and you've got things that you can use to talk to people and try to make a difference. Um, oh forward. Uh, embedded in that is a model um, which we've provided so teachers can also just use this if they want to run a simulation and teach through simulation. So to see to what extent this works, we did kind of a traditional research study, just pre, post, play the game in the middle. And uh, it's part of a broader um, research design and maybe worth taking a second on this. Um, this is called Preparation for Future Learning. It's one of the maybe more interesting ideas that come out of the learning sciences in the last 20 years. And the idea is that a good generative learning experience, one way that you know that it was actually worthwhile, and this is what probably will be intuitive for many teachers, is that they, when students go to learn the next thing, they do it much more easily. So in this case, what the idea is if everyone takes a pretest, and then a kid in an experimental group plays a game, whereas the other one reads a packet, give them a little test, and then on the next time, you flip it so the person played the game first reads. And the hypothesis would be that a, a player, student, whoever, who first plays the game, their interest is raised, they care. When they go and then and read, they have a better way uh, of absorbing the information, they have a better context for understanding it, it makes sense to them, they care, um, they uh, want to learn. And then with a post-test at the end. And so we did it with uh, two classes, and you can see here we found just that, that the kids learned through playing the game, but then they continued to have higher gains after they read as well. So consistent with this idea of preparation for future learning, the game set them up better than more traditional means, but it was really then when you combined them and then went and read afterwards that we saw some of the biggest gains happen. So again, what does this mean? Well, so for our curriculum, we start with playing this game, we're going to then talk a little bit more about the explore phase and then that study and build. So the next thing we had them do, so we'll, in the classroom, they played citizen science, they did these reading activities. The next thing we had them do was go outside and actually visit a lake. So as long as you're studying this kind of phenomena, it makes sense to go outside and do it. Um, another question I oftentimes get is, you know, do you really want kids playing a game for their whole curriculum? My answer is no. Um, you, you can go outside <laughs> in this case. So um, uh, they, we built a game called Saving Lake Wingra. Um, it's a, uh, in this game, you're playing, and this is the explore phase, they're playing as environmental scientists who need to manage this lake. So it's a different lake. Um, people in Wisconsin, this is much more important than probably the people out here, but there's some, it's a different type of lake, different feeding systems. It's more spring fed, has very different properties. So they go out to a lake in their environment. They go to these different points. They learn about different ecological studies happening. They learn about indicator species. They learn about how do you manage and identify the overall health of the lake. And in this case, they're playing a game using iPhones or other handheld devices. Um, they also have clipboards um, where they go around the lake. They've been hired by a team to understand what's going on. And then they need to make a final case at the end about what they think should happen to the lake. So again, they've played that earlier citizen science game. They've now gone on kind of this big field trip in like a six, seven day sort of game curriculum where they're going to make a decision about what they think should happen to this real world place that they go and visit. 
Um, we built this with a mobile learning app that we created. It's kind of a little side note. If you're interested in this kind of thing, if you're really interested in getting kids outside doing, think Pokemon Go. This is basically like Pokemon Go. Um, but instead of collecting Pokemon, you're collecting kind of water samples and other sort of scientific data. Um, it's an engine that we developed. There are about 5,000 games made for it. It's free. Um, the kicker, of course, you have to have everyone on either an iPhone or a, something like that, an iPad. So that becomes one of the trickier things. But it's, it's a popular free platform that you're all welcome to use. The kids play as different constituencies. So something that I got very interested in, trying to take a game approach, is saying, look, you're all competing, actually, and there are different people who have different groups with different interests. So the housing developers have different needs, say, than the recreational clubs, although they sometimes work hand in hand, they sometimes work at odds. Uh, we wanted to get away from very simplistic notions of, you know, you're the pro environment or not, and just talk about more management and what, what you want to do. Um, so, yeah, so these are some more features in there. Maybe I'll just kind of skip over that. Um, the idea then is that they out of game, so they're playing the game, but out of the game they're discussing those maps, looking at readings, and so on. Then the final step is designing a local study. So not all of the groups do this, but in some cases they did. One group decided to go off and, and study their own sort of drainage ditch pond thing in their backyard, uh, collecting data, looking at samples, seeing um, kind of what's going on. We, something we've seen happen more than once that's kind of interesting is that in this case they did down the road about a year later had an issue where there was um, a muskrat actually moved in, was eating up the shoreline. The city council actually was having a meeting about what should we do about this lake. And the kids came in and actually uh, testified to what they saw it happen because they did a study on it. Again, ironically, the game I mentioned, the first game I mentioned, had a muskrat in it. So they were kind of primed to do that because it, it is one of the things the scientists told us can happen. So they were able to actually do that. We've had, um, then in the end, they create models and they kind of uh, just, you know, present what they've learned about their lake. Um, this is another game. We've had multiple games where kids actually get in, involved in city council issues, which is kind of weird. Um, this is another one in Madison where they built a game about their neighborhood and then they um, identified some of the long-term housing trends and why it is that the, the neighborhood was originally African-American, Jewish, and Italian, and it later got bought up. So it's like, kind of like a little Brooklyn. It later got bought up by the hospitals, then people were dispersed. So as they were doing this history, they learned more about the links of where the uh, more economically hard hit areas were in Madison and how they got to be that way. And they actually uh, wrote and presented a city council resolution about what they thought should be happening for the priorities of the neighborhood moving forward, which is kind of cool. So that's one of the kids presenting there. Um, we've had other kids spontaneously write letters to the, to the editor in the newspaper, um, which is kind of cool. All right, so the next question we've been trying to do is, th th this was all great, but it was very much us working with some local teachers um, it's not going to scale easily. Within that network, there are more teachers borrowing ideas, but it's kind of a local or regional phenomenon. So um, the last example I want to talk about is a game called Equinaut, Equinauts, where we're trying to build this model out. Uh, this game is also it's kind of in the functioning tech demo phase. It's free online. I can give you a copy. It's, not, it's far from perfect. But the idea is that you're going to do the same kind of gameplay, but in this you're playing as the same sort of loggers and developers and people with orthogonal interests, but in a multiplayer game. So it's a lot like Clash of Clans or those other style games kids would have seen, like, oh, I'm mining and I'm gathering resources. In this case, you're doing them, but you're doing it on top of a simulation where if you say, um, uh, chop down, uh, if you, well, if you plant farms and use fertilizers right on the water's edge, you're going to get agricultural runoff and that downstream, that's going to get in someone else's yard and they're going to complain and so on. But they, each one is on a different iPad, but they're in the same multiplayer game. Um, so we also said so we, one of the funnier moments, I should say real quick, um, we have the, the game developers we have are all AAA people that worked on things like, you know, games that you would play like Call of Duty and stuff. And midway through, as I was doing my kind of nice science simulations, one of my developers said, you want us to make this a game? And I said, well, yeah, that's what we're doing here. He's like, nah, most of your stuff isn't really a game. Like, what do you mean? He's like, nah, give me, do you mind? Like if I cut a third of the educational features, put in a third of game stuff and see what happens? I said, please, please do. Because we always, like the educator in me, always just prioritizes some of the more valuable things for thinking and learning and less some of the, what people would call candy coding or whatever. So they went up and did a whole, you know, pass through where it's got leaderboards and characters and voiceovers. And it's really quite an engaging game. When we bring this in, kids treat it like they would Clash of Clans, I should say. It's generally not seen, it seemed more like a game and less like a school type thing. 
Underneath it is a simulation. So you can see this is a printout that we get, and we can show teachers of where the phosphates are moving, industrial wastes are, algae. So it's, they're playing it on top of the simulation. Um, we have data forms so that this is things that we can get back out. One of, our, one of my real interests in this, I should say, and one of my things that kind of keeps me going is that I think as we see analytics and so-called big data stuff come more and more, we're going to be able to track kids' activity more closely, but we're not, it's going to be harder to track things like creative problem solving, um, collaboration, and this is a kind of game that might be able to do that, and these are tools that might be able to do that. So that's from a research end, the kinds of things I'm trying to do to get that injected into the, global, the national conversation about these things. So the idea is that you could have design communities where kids, and this is what we're working on now, where kids can design their own scenarios. So if a kid plays this inland lake thing and says, that's great, but I live in California, and that's not a thing for us. I really want to do stormwater runoff or something. Then they can. And all right. Um, the other sort of thing that we're working on, I guess I want to give one sort of point, is uh, we have another game that's another version of this that's an out-and-out -out simulation, where if you wanted to really get in with the EPA, if they're allowed to interact with the public, anymore. I'm not sure if they are. <laughs> but if they were allowed to do so, um, games that really are based on predictive models where you can get in there and say, oh, if we change this policy, here's what's going to happen. Um, and I have a colleague, Ben Shapiro out of Colorado, who's working on that. So the questions I think about when I look at games, and this is some things to kind of think about, is what keeps a good game from a bad game? This is, is a game that really is going to foster interest in a game. Are they, do they simulate something? Many of my favorite games for learning have some form of simulation behind them. So you're actually playing and experimenting and trying to learn by thinking through. What roles are available for the students? So are, is this, the, the better games typically say you're going to be either a scientist or a person saving the world or a person doing something, not someone memorizing or trying to solve a problem just to get a test right, whatever. Um, do those goals, goals compelling? Can students be productive and creative? Many great games, tend, kids get excited and they want to you know, shout, yell, argue. Those are signs of a good game. And then last, can they, do those provide ways to lead to them to become actively participants in something? So something we've tried to do, again, with that game, say the Freshwater Lakes, is we have it where it's kind of obvious for the teachers and students and everyone, if you wanted to really do something like real citizen science, or if you wanted to write a letter, here's the thing, here are the things that you could do. And maybe that happens even after school. It doesn't have to happen in school. But are they on ramp? So that's a possibility. Um, the last one is I, I really do think that learning analytics have the power to potential to be very powerful. They also could be very uh, Orwellian. Uh, we, we're, we do lead a national consortium of people doing game-based analytics, trying to set standards for how do you do it well. What are the right sort of policies? Um, I think it's a powerful tool. It's going to happen, but it has the potential to be um, maybe dangerous. Um, again, none of this necessarily requires a digital game. It's what I tend to do. I think there's a lot of power in it, but it's not necessarily required by a digital game. You could do something like this, play, explore, study, build with face-to-face role-playing, um, film, documentary, reading, um, and then inquiry-based learning and building stuff. I think more and more... You know, as we are in a digital society, it's good to try to infuse these things, um, particularly computational thinking, but it's not inherently required. Um, two other things that I think of just in terms of my own kind of former Montessori, maybe something to leave you on, is that in general, regardless of games, as we look at the shifting nature of education and the shifting neighbor, nature of social institutions in a digital age, how do we find ways to take them maybe starting where you're a game player in a safe sandbox, but how do we move them through time in different domains eventually so that they graduate as people really participating who have an active affiliation with school and with society, where they see themselves as actively contributing and being a part of, um, where they are making things in addition to consuming. And I should say, this is, for me at least, um, reflecting on Oh, just the national and global events of the last six months, 12 months, elections, and so on. For me, I think one of the real signs is that I would love to see our schools try to have more and more people who do feel um, affiliation, who don't feel as... Uh, in, in Wisconsin, it's kind of famous. famous there's a, a, a book about this, about um, the nature of um, disaffiliation and... Res and um, um, what was the word I'm looking for here? Um, missing it. Um, alienation, I guess, uh, toward many of the overall social structures. Um, and schools sometimes, sadly, end up doing some of that as well. Um, so here's some of our funders, the research people. And um, I look forward to either answering questions or collaborating as we set root in Southern California. So thank you.